Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the 325th episode of the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Sherman Oaks, California at the Malamut Vintage Car Center, a great collection of cars owned by Mike Malamut. Mike, come on out here. Oh, I have spoken. Good, good. good. good Can we take you. a look inside? Yeah, let's go. Mike, this is a very impressive collection. A lot of foreign cars in here, beautiful cars. How did this all come about? How did this collection start? Well, ever since I was a small child, I was in, uh, infatuated with cars. Uh, I remember my dad had a 55 Studebaker Speedster, and uh, he would drive me around in that, and the, the 64 and a half Mustang came out, and I started pointing out every Mustang I could see, and after a while I said, shut up, I don't want to hear about Mustangs anymore, and I, I just had the bug ever since I was a child, and, and uh, when I was uh, going to high school, all my friends would end up in, uh, you know, going to high school dances and football games, and I was in the backyard working on cars to help put myself through school, and I was sort of a self-taught mechanic and I started collecting cars over 30 years ago and I started uh, collecting cars as any young uh, individual would uh, in the early 60s and, and uh, they were either 55 Chevrolets and Mustangs and things like that and, and then one year when I started increasing my collection uh, I was at the Barrett Jackson auction and I saw a Messerschmitt on a corner lot in the back of a pickup truck and I asked what that was and I got kind of hooked from that point on. You, know, you get one and then they, people find you and you kind of say, what other unique little cars did they make in that era? Uh -huh. Well, you have a Messerschmitt around the corner that's kind of shoehorned in there. Can we take a closer look oh, at that? Oh, sure, absolutely. Right. Everybody knows what a Messerschmitt is, but some people don't know that they made Cars, this one has four wheels on it. Uh, that one has three, so I'm not sure if we're looking at a car or, or a motorcycle. But <laughs> okay. Tell us about your Messerschmitt. Okay. Well, Messerschmitt, uh, the designer was Fritz Fend, and they call them Messerschmitts. The uh, Messerschmitt factory really didn't build Messerschmitts. They built the airplanes. But uh, after the war, they were constricted from building uh, any military vehicles, and they had uh, a lot of room in their factory, so Fritz Friend rented space from Willie Messerschmitt and uh, then designed these little cars which would be alternative transportations to big cars. And uh, they had several different models over the years. This being one of the earliest models, it's a bubble top, a 1955, and it's got the plaid interior. They're a one-cylinder Sax engine, do about 60 miles an hour and about 100 miles per gallon. So in in today's world, that would probably be practical Pretty transportation. Impressive. And then uh, they came out with some various models. This is a later model. This one here is a Roadster, and uh, it's uh, early 60s, and it's one of 12 built. That's a full convertible, a uh, real rare piece. Again, one cylinder. And then uh, Fritz Fenn decided he wanted to get into racing and he built what he called was the Tiger, TG Tiger, which was a 500cc two-cycle motor, 20 horsepower, and this will do about 90 miles an hour. And a little car it's like a go-kart was quite successful in places like Goodwood. He built about uh, 300 of these, and there's 60 of them left in the world today, so quite collectible. Have you taken this out on the, the freeway? Or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've had it up to 75 miles an hour on the freeway. It's like a little go-kart. And uh, it's a real car. Uh, the difference between the first two, uh, these are mechanical brakes and a sort of a ratchet transmission, where this one has a full transmission, full reverse, and hydraulic brakes. It's uh, actually a little miniature real car. Mm -hmm. What year is this? Uh, this one's a 58. 58. And they made them from when to when? Uh, Tigers came out, they were just a short run from about uh, 57 to around 61, the Tigers. And the Messerschmitts themselves? Messerschmitts ran from 55 to about 64. Well, can I test that cockpit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, absolutely. It's a rather unique way to climb in this. Okay. Very carefully, it'd probably be the, the well, cue here. seat goes up, okay. right, just seat like that rises lands, up. and you right. can sit in, and then you pull the seat forward. Okay. You kind of let it pull forward. Okay. All factory equipment, cup holders, heated seat, mm -hmm. nice roomy interior. Okay. So you don't want to be claustrophobic. If Power you windows, it's got all the options. <laughs> well, you can see everywhere, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh. 
What's the acceleration like? Is it similar to a motorcycle or is it kind of slow? No, it's pretty good. Yeah, it, it gets up and goes. And it looks like they couldn't decide whether they wanted a, a steering wheel or handlebars here, so they did a little of both. Yeah, yeah. When people say bubble cars or think of these motorcycle-powered small vehicles, I think the car that comes to everybody's mind is an Isetta. You have a very nice one here. What year is this and what's the history of yeah, it? Yeah, this is a 57 Isetta Lance, and uh, what's unique about it, it's one of six convertible bubble tops that they made. And the difference between the bubble top and the later models is this one has a rounded window and the later models are called sliders. So this is a unique part, part of uh, my collection being as, as it's rare and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it, this is the kind of car that puts a smile on everybody's face. Uh, right. Well, it's a BMW Isetta, but somebody else made Isettas before BMW? Yes. yes. Uh, the originally design was made by Isu. And, uh, Italy and then BMW after the war they were having problems with uh, selling their big cars they needed something with economy and they were uh, in a tight financial situation so they bought the licensing rights from ISU and then rebuilt the car put a new body on it they used the BMW motorcycle engine and they ended up selling over 200,000 of these and this got them out of their financial ruins Save, save the company. Well, speaking of getting out of or getting in, it's pretty unique how these open up. Can you show us that? Oh, sure, absolutely. Just uh, you open them just like that, and that'll that lets you in. So you can uh, a lot of room actually for a couple of people. So this is just like opening up a refrigerator. Uh huh. Exactly. Well, let's try this. There. So you just climb in and just shut it behind you. Yeah. And then the, you pull the handle. Okay. And then you just turn it, pull it down and turn it, okay. just like that. There you go. Okay, you're all set, ready to just go. Just snug over. This is surprisingly roomy inside. It is. Yeah, it feels fine in here. So it has 300 on, on it. What's it? 300 cc's. It was an American model. They built 250 cc's for a European, and the Americans got a much 50 cc more. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's a whole 13 horsepower. And it'll, it'll do about 55 miles uh, per hour and over 50 miles per gallon. So these, you can drive these on the freeway? Or? Absolutely, totally legal. I mean, you want to be in the far right lane, uh, but uh, it causes a lot of attention. Speaking of, a lot of your cars here, you just don't see these cars on the road. When you're going down the freeway, and are people, do you have to be careful that people don't run into you because they're staring at you? Yeah, you have to drive defensively, but uh, you know, you only go around once in life, so why not to give it a shot? I, I do drive these cars. In fact, you know, we can give it a shot. I don't know. Uh, why don't you flip that key on, see if this thing will start? If it starts, okay. There you go. There, there you go. <laughs> Maybe we'll go for a ride later if you'd like. Mike, this looks like, no offense now, but this looks like something that drove right out of a Disney movie or, or a cartoon <laughs> or something. And this is so small, it looks like this could be put in the back seat of the Isetta. What, what do we have here? Uh, this is a uh, Auto Bianchina. Uh, Say it again. Auto Bianchina. Auto Bianchina. Yeah, and uh, they were actually a coach-built car. Bianchina was a coach builder, and uh, they were they used a Fiat chassis and then built just a beautiful body. It reminds me a little bit, if you look at the side, sort of like a Mustang. A little bit, some, yeah. Got some lines and. Uh, just a real uh, crowd pleaser, this car. So by coach builder, you mean it's just like somebody took their Rolls Royce chassis into a custom builder and they built this, well, it's the same thing, just a smaller version. Right, right. And so, in other words, if you're back in uh, Italy in its day, if, if you had a little more money or a little more budget than a typical Fiat 500, you would then go for an Auto Bianchina and you would get the uh, more stylish version. So this is uh, Fiat running gear underneath it's all this. All Fiat. So yeah. what, what do we have under the under the metal? Well, it's a total of 500 cc's. <laughs> That's it, and uh, it'll do 60, 65 miles uh, per hour on the road. With the canvas top on it, back when this was new, was and this was driving down the the street. Uh, people looked at it, did they go, boy, that's, that's something special, or that's cute, or where did this fit in, in kind of the prestige uh, list? 
Well, it was for somebody that didn't have a big budget that couldn't afford your Ferrari or, you know, or Lamborghini or something like that that wanted economy, but they wanted to stand out from the crowd and have something a little more stylish. If you look at the interior, the colors, the two-tone, just the whole beautiful style, it was a car that would say, hey, look at me, yet you didn't have to have a real big budget, a little more than a typical Fiat. Mm -hmm. Your collection is just overwhelming with warm and fuzzy. There's, it seems like every car that I, literally every car that I've seen in your collection is a car that the general public, even the non-car people, they're gonna go, what a cute car, gee, I like that car, or, or, or whatever. Is that what you run across? Absolutely, I have, uh, from time to time, we have car night here where we'll invite, or car clubs will contact me. In fact, the latest car club was the Gullwing Group, and these are people with a big Mercedes, you know, $600,000, dollar gullwings. I actually own one myself and uh, they just went crazy here. They just had not seen cars like this and in fact uh, many of the individuals from the group were giving me offers on cars. I said well it's just my private collection. I don't, it's not really a sales floor here and uh, but they fell in love with the cars. I've had two Volkswagen Beetles. I've had two Volkswagen Squarebacks. Great cars. I've never had a bus. Love them. We just shot a big Volkswagen bus show in Lake Havasu, Arizona. Over 200 buses showed up. Warm. And this is this is like a warm loaf of bread. Here, tell us about this. Well, I, first, before I tell you about this, Lance, I got to tell you a little bit about myself. I started out working my way through college as a VW Porsche mechanic. I ended up working at Bob Smith, Porsche Audi, Volkswagen, and Hollywood. And uh, I've had a love for these VWs for, since I was very, very young and have a big collection of Volkswagens. Uh, uh, probably have 10 buses and a lot of convertibles and, and various other models, Carmen Ghias. But the bus is, uh, you know, that's your fun factor. Uh, very utilitarian. You could put nine people in this bus and how I came upon this bus was uh, Dr. Christensen. He was an orthopedic surgeon and he uh, as a hobby liked to restore cars. He did uh, his first car that I bought from him was this uh, little 52 Volkswagen convertible over there which he did a fantastic job and I asked the doctor I said what's your next project and he said uh, well I'm gonna do a bus. I haven't done a bus before. I said put me on the list. Well he Two years later, he delivered me this beautiful bus, and uh, it's won best in class, best in show at just about every show it's competed. And we decided to do something real special. Along with the bus, we wanted a, a real uh, attraction. So what we did was take a little Ariba Puck trailer, which is a German trailer that was built for Volkswagens and you know Isettas and small cars that could tow in Europe and uh, we did the trailer to match the bus and uh, when you put the two together at a car show people just go wild. A Reba Puck? Is a Reba Puck trailer, uh -huh, a little German trailer. A trailer behind a Volkswagen bus sounds like a very slow moving combination. It does, uh, but when you think about it, a bus is slow anyway and there's not too much uh, that's going to slow it down and the Reba Puck trailer only weighs about 500 pounds and, and frankly, when you tow it behind the bus, you don't even know it's there. So uh, I go down the freeway 5560 uh, with a trailer, and we go to shows, and uh, this is just a showstopper everywhere it goes. We have German cars in here. We have Italian cars in here. We have French cars in here. What is more, some people might say a Fiat is very French, but I think a Citroen is, is really the epitome of an uh, unusual French car. What do we have here? Well, this is a Citroen. Uh, Citroen? Citroen, that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, I've, uh, three years ago, purchased a home in France, and uh, so I'm kind of learning yeah. correct pronunciations. And uh, this is uh, considered the French Volkswagen and it's called uh, two CV or du chevaux, which means two horses, it's a two cylinder. And the French refer to this car as the du chevaux. Uh, they built uh, hundreds of thousands of these. They built them up until 1990. And uh, as early as I think, um, well, I think the first one was maybe uh, late 40s uh, to uh, 1990 and terrific little car. Uh, this is a 1983. Uh, uh, was not allowed to come in the U.S. Uh, because of smog and safety, but however, it belonged to the French consulate, and I was lucky to get it from them. So it's one of the later models that was legally imported to the U.S. And uh, the color combination is a little bit rare and very popular, and 
This is a car, Lance, that you can go down the road on the freeway 6570 and get 40 miles per gallon. Very practical, easy to work on, two cylinders, and just fun to drive. Uh, the story behind this car, the design was it was supposed to be for the everyday person in France that, uh, where it was very affordable. And the test was for the farmer to put a carton of eggs, a basket of eggs in the front seat, go over rough terrain, and if it didn't break the eggs, then they knew they had the suspension right. And it's basically that way. It's got a terrific suspension, almost impossible. It'll lean like crazy, but it won't flip. Hmm. And uh, becoming very, very popular. You mentioned that they weren't allowed in the country and this one got in because it was part of the consulate. Do you need any kind of special permit to drive this now because it doesn't meet emissions or? Oh, you... Not a problem. It's, uh, it's licensed for the California U.S. roads and they still bring them in even to this day. But what they do is they have a later body and engine, but they'll bring in, they'll attach uh, early uh, frame and they, they use the serial numbers of the frame for the year of registration. Okay. So most of them will be later bodies, could be even up till 1990, but it'll have like a 67 frame. And I think the cutoff on these was 67, bringing them in legally to the U.S. The Japanese made some great cars. They've been making them since the 30s and before that, I'm sure. Uh, this particular body style, we have a Datsun Fair Lady. Yeah. So an, an unusual name for a sports car, but a great looking car. What's the story? Well, this is a 1964 Fair Lady, and in this uh, body design, this configuration, they made uh, 1500s. 1600s, 18s, and 2000s, and this is a 1964 1500, so a very early example of the Fair Lady. And uh, I was fortunate, uh, Datsun, or Nissan dealer at the time, had this and a few trucks and a few other cars in his showroom, and they were gathering so much attention that they couldn't sell new cars, so the factory told them to sell the classic cars, and I was luckily able to uh, get this car. A lot of these, there weren't a lot, but the ones that were around seemed like maybe they weren't taken that serious back then. They were more of a throwaway car, so to find one that is in this kind of condition is pretty amazing. Absolutely. I'm very fortunate. I mean, the, the uniqueness about this car is uh, being a 1500, but it also has the metal dash rather than all the plastic or vinyl, and, and it's got the sideways rear seat. 
and just a terrific little car. He, you know, cruised at 80 miles an hour, and a uh, car that gets a lot of attention at car shows also. Uh, back in 1965, I spent about six months in Hawaii on Oahu, and one of my buddies there, he had one of these, so we, we went riding the, in these, and I actually got a ticket back then, a $15 ticket for riding in the back on the trunk lid sitting up there instead uh -oh. of being in the seat like I should be. So it's a, it has a, a warm and fuzzy spot in my heart. So we have the sexy sports car over there. We have the utilitarian truck here, a Datsun pickup. What year is this and what model? This is a 1959 Datsun pickup truck and it's a thousand cc's, so very small. And uh, Datsun did a test in 1959 to see if they could sell uh, their trucks in the U.S. They only imported 10, and this is one of the first 10 trucks uh, brought to uh, the U.S. So very fortunate. I think there's only two or three of them around. Uh, and uh, so we have one of the two or three. So they sold 10 the first year and 12 the second year, or how did the sales Well, it go? started ramping up pretty good. Uh, the second year was a, virtually the same style, and uh, they... Uh, I think they sold probably 40 or 50 the second year, and then thereafter it started picking up steam. Mm -hmm. Do you think having the uh, optional German Shepherd in the front seat uh, impeded or, or helped their sales? It actually helped. They say dogs love trucks, so if you have a dog, you got to get a truck. Uh, that's Bear. <laughs> Bear loves that truck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who bought these back then? I, I would think that the truck market in 1959, if you didn't have a, a new Ford or Chev, you didn't have a real truck. Who, where did these go? I don't know. Uh, probably not a lot. There's only 10 of them sold in 59, so I would think it was maybe your Japanese gardeners that wanted to, uh, you know, have a, they had maybe a love for the homeland and let me get something Japanese, just like we say now, buy American to support America. Maybe they were the first ones, but you really, uh, the truck maybe will do 55, 60 on the freeway, so it wasn't, uh, a real powerful truck, so I would say it'd be good for odd jobs on a farm or, or maybe the gardener just going on a route in the neighborhood. It'd make a lot of sense in the city. We shot a show at the Toyota USA Museum and they had the stout trucks there and that's exactly what they said, that they were real popular with landscape companies. Yeah. So I, I've got one over there we're going to restore. Okay. A stout. Speaking 65. of over there, these are gorgeous cars. I know you've bought a lot of these cars in this condition, but you've also restored a lot of them. You have a re restoration facility here. Uh -huh. Tell us about that. Well, uh, when I'm brain dead, which is most of the time, uh, I try to, I've learned over the years as a collector, you're much better off buying something that was restored correctly and already done, because usually an individual can't get the money you put into right. one of these cars in a restoration process. So if I can find a car like this car I bought virtually the way it is, and if I can find them finished, that's the way I'll buy them. But sometimes, uh, because of the rarity, you have to take what you can get, and then I get stuck uh, restoring cars. So we have a few cars over there we're in the process of restoring right now. Japanese, French, German, Italian, but you do like American cars too. You have a few of those tucked away. Oh, right? absolutely. Uh, I'm one of these guys, like my wife says, why don't you stay with one mark? It'll make it simple. So then we're looking, setting up our calendar. If you only collected Corvettes, Mike, we can go to the Corvette shows and have a great time. But with me, I'm a nutcase. So, you know, I'll look at the calendar. Oh, they're having a Corvette show today. Oh, a Porsche show. Oh, a micro crochet or a Volkswagen show. And I get in that mess of trying to pick which shows I want to go to. And it's, it's sometimes they conflict. And uh, I think uh, the U.S. manufacturers have built some wonderful cars over the years. And uh, they, they're actually unduplicated, such as, you know, the GTO. It's got a whole cult behind it. The Beach Boys and uh, their song, the GTO. And... And uh, of course, Corvette, that's an American icon, sports car, I have a few of those. And, and I like utilitarian vehicles also. I like the trucks and the Jeeps and... Uh, and you have a Falcon down there? Is that yeah. a, a Sprint? Is that a little what I Falcon said? Sprint, yeah, a little convertible six-cylinder. That's actually my son's car, uh -huh. Matthew's car. And uh, just a cute little example, all original. And uh, we believe it has very, very low miles on it. Mike, thank you very much for the invitation to come take a look at the Malamut Vintage Car Center here in Sherman Oaks, California. If somebody wants to get a hold of you or find out more about the collection, what do they do? Uh, it's pretty easy, Lance. Uh, just contact me at my email. It's the letter M, then Malamut, M-A-L-A-M-U-T, at AOL.com. All right, great. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the use of the... Uh, 
I, uh, what's the pronunciation? Izetta. Izetta. Okay, I've been saying Izetta for so many okay. years. Izetta. So well, have a great time. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll see you back in Washington. All right. We'll get good gas mileage. Yeah, yeah, it may take me a week to get home. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. See you later. Yeah. Come there.